Hey, good morning. It's good to see everyone. What a beautiful, gorgeous weekend that we're experiencing. This is awesome, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, it is, Pastor Randy. It's a wonderful weekend. Yes, it is. Good to talk to you, Pastor Randy. Nice to see you this morning. Good morning. Good morning, Pastor Randy. <laughs> oh, it is good to see everyone. Welcome all of you who have joined us online as well this morning. Happy Father's Day. Day. Some really, really quick announcements, and we're going to move right into worship. Um, in, the, in the next month, in July, we've got a couple things coming up. The next Willing Women Ministry Meeting is July 9th. That is a Saturday. I think it's the same time, roughly, 4 o'clock in the afternoon. And if you have any questions, ask Kara or Katie Tolliver. And um, it was very, very successful this last time around. They're just hoping for some momentum. And, uh, and good forward movement. And so our next family night at Sunrise Community Church is this following Sunday on the 10th. And so uh, I, I'd love to see uh, like a eu euchre tournament going on while the kids are playing volleyball and acting silly out there like they think they are young. So let's get some euchre going in that, turn in that day if you're available. And let's see what we can do in terms of prizes like I don't know because I'll win maybe Texas Roadhouse or something like that. All right, so last but not least, I will make more comments about this at the end, about the roof and all that kind of stuff. There was a lot of things that happened in the last several days, uh, all to really our advantage. And so I'll share all that at the end of the service. But before we get started this morning, I'd like for you to stand, and we're going to go back and repeat several verses that we have been talking about over the last several weeks. Last week, Ron did not talk about them because he spoke on what the Bible talks about where mental health is concerned and did an excellent job of really opening up our eyes to the realities of mental health. We have a mental health crisis in our world right now, so very much needed word from the Lord. But several weeks ago, I was just talking about just the whole sense of the world and the evil and all of that and what we are instructed to do as believers and followers of Christ. Ephesians 5, don't act thoughtlessly, but understand what the Lord wants you to do. What's he want us to do? Don't be drunk with wine or anything else that will consume your life and ruin your life. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs among yourselves, making music to the Lord with your hearts, and give thanks for everything, right? Give thanks. So if you have not come this morning ready to thank and praise the Lord, just take a few seconds and do an attitude adjustment because it is the right and worthy thing to do. It's not based on whether we feel like it, not based on whether we have it within us. We just rise up, we do a sacrifice of praise, and I'm not talking about neglecting real issues in our lives. I'm talking about rising above those issues. Amen? Father, we just come to you in the name of Jesus. We're so glad to be in your house and in the presence of the Lord among your people, among people who have various needs, various walks of life. Some have come in maybe with a lot of stuff, a lot of baggage. Maybe others have come in just expecting great things. Either way, you are here to meet us. We thank you for that. We look forward to that. We anticipate you connecting with us right where we are because you are the answer. You have the answers. You are the great I am, the God who can. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we introduced this song few weeks ago and you've now had a few weeks to learn it i told you when we got to the chorus i wanted you to be loud with it it's not a not a new song anymore so i want to hear you guys shout this out this morning amen, amen. there's nothing that our god can't do amen, amen. Just one word, the darkness 
attached to a tree Just one touch I feel the presence of heaven Just one touch My eyes were open to see My heart can't help but Come on church There's nothing that I God can't do There's not a
that this morning, church? Do you believe that there is nothing that your God can't do? Do you believe that in spite of everything you see, in spite of everything that you may fear, that God is a good God? That God is always in control? And that you can trust in that? You can trust in His sovereignty. You can trust in His goodness and in His faithfulness. This morning, we're going to spend some time reflecting on that faithfulness, reflecting on his goodness. So what I would like to do is as we go into this next song, I would like you to just kind of draw a little circle around yourself, a little invisible circle, and forget that anyone else in this room exists this morning. Forget that there's a world full of messes and problems that you got to figure out at noon whenever we leave this place. Forget about all of that for just a second and just put all of your attention on his goodness, on his faithfulness, on his mercy, on his love, and on his patience and how he can move in us and use us and change us into the people that he's called us to be. Amen. so faithful Lord I can trust you I can trust you I can trust you to get me through the day yes I can trust you I can trust you I can trust you always make a way oh there's never been anyone like you never been anyone like you you are worthy yes you are worthy oh there's never been anyone like you never been anyone like you you are worthy you are worthy Oh, there's never been anyone like you, never been anyone like you. You are worthy. You are. We lift it to you this morning, God. There's never been anyone like you, never been anyone like you. You are worthy. Oh, you are worthy. One more time. Oh, there's never been anyone like you, never been anyone like you. You are worthy, yes, you are worthy, yeah. Height or depth, no height or depth can separate your steadfast love who can escape your faithfulness and endless sea, so full of grace and mercy, and we. 
So we sing, God, you're so good. God, you're so good. God, you're so good. You're so good to me. Thank you, Father, for your goodness and your faithfulness to us. Yet, while we were sinners, Jesus Christ, your Son, your only begotten Son, went to the cross on our behalf, died a cruel death, was destroyed in terms of his body, his human body. Three days later, he came back again so that we could be saved and filled and anointed for the glory of your name. Thank you. Thank you. You are so good. As we transition into this next song, just talks about being weak, but yet your spirit is strong. Our flesh may fail, but God, you never do. Give me faith. And again, we can sing and we can proclaim and we, de- we can declare and then we can walk out of this building and get punched in the gut. Again, as Ron said, in spite of what we see, in spite of what the world is saying and doing, in spite of what the chaos is all around us, in His goodness, in His faithfulness, He still has a plan And he knows what the end looks like for all of us. Give me faith to believe, Lord. Give me faith. I know I already have faith, but stir that faith in me. In these difficult and hard times, stir that faith in me. Especially us as men and fathers and leaders where literally our identity is being destroyed every day as we walk into this crazy world, give us faith to believe that how you've designed us and how you've wired us is exactly what you want. And all of this we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen.
felt weak like you couldn't go on anymore yeah. <laughs> ever feel like an utter failure yeah. man I'm so thankful but I have a great God a loving God a caring God a faithful God dwelling inside of me by his spirit his presence is alive and well within me and constantly supporting me and encouraging me and lifting me up when I fail and pulling me out of the mud when I fall down. So thankful, so grateful. Let's sing that bridge one more time. Because I may be weak, but your spirit's strong in me. My flesh may fail. My God, you never will. Yes, I may be weak, but your spirit's strong in me. My flesh may fail, but my God, One more time, I may be weak. Yes, I may be weak, but your spirit's strong in me. My flesh may fail, but my God, you never will. You know, I know it's a little bit foreign for some of us who grew up in Baptist and Methodist and Episcopal traditions and all that kind of stuff. But why don't we just clap and give God just a really good hand clap of praise right now. I know, I know how it feels and it sounds like, oh, all those weird churches do that. No, people who love the Lord do that. People who love the Lord, people who worship the Lord in spirit and truth. Get excited. Listen, I, I go to baseball games and watch baseball sometimes that's terrible and people clap. <laughs> I watch kids' soccer, you know, when they huddle around the ball and they don't move except just, to, you know, the ball's moving and they're moving. The little toddlers and kids. And it's painful to watch. But parents are clapping and yelling and screaming, Go, Junior! And they can't even see Junior because he's in the midst on the, floor, on the ground hug, hug, hugging the ball. You are worthy, Lord. You are worthy. You are worthy. Amen. Amen. All right, you can be seated this morning. 
Once again, happy Father's Day. I'm sure today, men, all of you will be sitting back in your recliner in your relaxing chair while your wives and family work and do everything to serve you. <laughs> Since it didn't happen on Mother's Day in your home, probably won't happen for you either. So, All right, anyway. So what does the Bible say about? That's our current series. And obviously today would be a good day to ask the question, what does the Bible say about fatherhood, right? Amen. About fathers, about dads, about men. How to be a godly father, how to be godly examples as father figures. Maybe we don't, maybe we haven't had children or we've not birthed children or had the opportunity to raise children, but we are a father figure to many, more than we realize. So what we're going to see this morning is, this, you know, there's always some direct passages that, that really nail on some things in terms of a subject matter. Sometimes, sometimes not. But there's always some scriptural references. And this morning we're going to see both direct passages and examples of godly men, stories of godly men in scripture. So it's obviously that the subject matter is, is, is tender to the heart of God, our heavenly father, God. He's our example perfect example of fatherhood though he be perfect through his mercy and grace he draws us into relationship through jesus christ by the holy spirit and he empowers us to be the men the leaders the people that we need to be be ye continually being filled by the spirit of god daily for what we have to face today not only in our families but in our culture so regardless of where you are today you know mother's day can be tough and father's day can be tough um Always try to be sensitive to that and aware of that, that when we say happy Mother's Day, happy Father's Day, maybe not everyone's all that happy. Maybe they didn't have a good experience. Maybe their dads were there but very absent. Maybe there was a divorce. Maybe there was some level of brokenness. Maybe you had a great dad. Maybe you had deep father wounds. and Maybe you're still in recovery for some of that. I want to encourage you, regardless of where you're at, this is not to shame you or, or to heap more heaviness on you wherever you might be, even those of you who are listening this morning. You know, with the women, often Proverbs 31 is the context for a godly woman. You know, that perfect lady in Proverbs 31. You know, there should be a Proverbs 32 for the perfect man. You know, 21 attributes of a perfect father figure. So our goal is to encourage you and to be grateful and thankful for God's grace that though we make mistakes and though we fail, his grace is sufficient to carry us through to make changes in the future. And I want to encourage you. Recently, I had an encounter with a young man. There was three boys in that family. Divorce happened early. And before the divorce, those three boys were physically, emotionally, and verbally abused on a regular basis. They're in their 30s and 40s now, and there was a disconnect with their father that whole time. And all that was between them and their father was hatred, resentment, and anger. But I'm here to tell you that God is a, an amazing God, and there's nothing that our God can't do. And he got the attention of the father, and those relationships have been restored. Not perfectly but they're on a pathway to healing and reconciliation that is awesome. Never give up. Never give up hope. Never quit praying and believing. So as I was preparing, you know, I'm looking through and, and, and just, you know, searching for kind of a, a catchy title or, or sermon uh, ideas that, that might just stir some other thinking that I have. And, and, and so... I was looking through, and, and, and honestly, some of the lists are pretty daunting. It's like, you know, uh, the perfect father model, you know, and again, we know our Heavenly Father's perfect and all that. And then I saw, what are you building your life on? And what makes a hero? Well, you know, kids have heroes in their life. And what if you're not measuring up to that hero status? And this is a good one. Would you want your daughter to marry you? That's pretty gut check, right? Because daughters often end up marrying someone like their dad. 
I like this one. Man up. <laughs> What's it even mean? So, and then you go to Scripture, and like I said, there's some specific Scriptures that we could have tackled this morning. Ephesians 6, Colossians 3 come to mind. Fathers, do not exasperate your children. This is a command. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Fathers, do not embitter your children or they'll become discouraged. And Paul wrote both of those passages, and kind of you just want to respond back to Paul like, do you know how annoying and frustrating my children are? And I'm not supposed to annoy them or frustrate them? But yet, sometimes in our best efforts, that's what we do. I know I've been very good at that through the years of my children just being exasperated because I was so annoying. I think at this point in our lives, they've forgiven me, I hope. But regardless, I think the Lord wants to always try to show us, open our eyes that we can see, show us where there's areas that we can grow and mature. It's never too late to make changes. It's never too late to grow up and mature. It's never too late to learn and understand what does it take to be a good father, a good leader, a good man of God. So um, here's where I landed. I landed in uh, Second Chronicles. We're going to go there here in a second. And I have an acronym that we're going to use at the end. I'm going to use the whiteboard and I'm going to have some fun at the end, hopefully. But also in Scripture, you know, in looking at the qualifications for men in church leadership, you know, deacons and servants and elders and all that kind of stuff, here's some words that came out, and I think this is really interesting. An overseer is one who looks or watches over, okay? A shepherd is one who tends herds or flocks, not merely one who feeds them. It's metaphorically for pastors like myself, shepherds guide as well as feed, feed the sheep, the word of the Lord and that kind of stuff, to lead, to preside over, to stand before, to attend to, to care for, you know, I was looking at those, and I think those are qualifications for leaders within the church, but those are also qualifications for men who lead their families because we're shepherds of our families. We're overseers of our families, and we're to lead and preside over and attend to. So turn to Second Chronicles 31. I have a key couple verses that I, I want us to look at to start with. And then I'm going to go back to 2 Chronicles 28, 29, 30, and 31. We're not going to read all four chapters, but we are going to highlight and pull some verses out of there because I want to give you some context. And this is about King Hezekiah. And uh, also, as we look back in 2 Chronicles 28, we're going to look at King Ahaz real quickly. But 2 Chronicles 3, uh, 31, verses 20 through 21, let's, let's look at this and read this. This is what Hezekiah did throughout Judah. Doing what was good and right and faithful before the Lord his God. In everything, we might say that together, in everything, and we might say it like we believe it, in everything that he undertook in the service of God's temple and in obedience to the law and the commands, he sought his God and worked wholeheartedly, and so he prospered. Father, we just pray a, a blessing on your word, reading of it, and I pray that, God, you would inspire us and open our eyes to see what you want to tell us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. So in Second Chronicles 28, now this is going to be a lot of context here, but we're going to get to, to a point where we're going to make some sense out of this. But you've got you to get the whole picture here. And so in Second Chronicles 28, Ahaz, the kingdom was split. And so Ahaz was 22 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem 16 years. Unlike David, his father, he did not do what was right in the, sight of, in the eyes of the Lord. He followed the ways of the kings of Israel and also made idols for worshiping the Baals. Ahaz gathered together the furnishings from the temple of God and cut them in pieces. He shut the doors of the Lord's temple and set up altars at every street corner in Jerusalem. In every town in Judah, he built high places to burn sacrifices to other gods. And what does it say? Arouse the anger of the Lord, the God of his ancestors. Now we're going to jump to chapter 29. Hezekiah was 25 years old. So these guys are young. Okay, They're young in leadership. 25 when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem 29 years. His mother's name was Abijah, daughter of Zechariah. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, just as his father David had done. So, in the first month, verse 3, 
In the first year of his reign, he opened the doors of the temple and repaired them. He brought in priests, Levites, assembled them in the square, said, listen to me, consecrate yourselves and consecrate the temple of God, your ancestors. Remove all defilement from the sanctuary. Our parents were unfaithful. They did evil in the eyes of the Lord and God forsook them. He turned, they turned their faces away from the Lord's dwelling place and turned their backs on him. Therefore... The anger of the Lord has fallen on Judah and Jerusalem. He's made them an object of dread and horror and scorn, as you can see with your own eyes. This is why our fathers have fallen by the sword, why our sons and daughters and wives are in captivity. Now I intend to make a covenant with the Lord, the God of Israel, so that his fierce anger will turn away from us. My sons, do not be negligent now, for the Lord has chosen you to stand before him. Verse 12, he set the Levites to work. There's a list of all their names. We are ignoring that. Verse 15, when they had assembled their fellow Levites and consecrated themselves, they went to purify the temple and the king had, as the king had ordered, following the word of the Lord. The priests, verse 16, went into the sanctuary of the Lord to purify it. They brought out into the courtyard everything that was unclean. Say everything unclean that they found in the temple. And the Levites took it and carried it to the Kidron Valley where they destroyed it later. Then they went into King Hezekiah, 18, we've purified the temple. Verse 27, Hezekiah gave the order to sacrifice burnt offering on the altar. And as they began offering, they began singing to the Lord, accompanied by trumpets and the instruments of David, king of Israel. Verse 29, when the offerings were finished, the king and everyone present with him knelt down and worshipped. King Hezekiah and his officials ordered the Levites to praise the Lord with the words of David and Asaph the seer. So they sang praises with gladness and bowed down and worship. So the service of the temple of the Lord was reestablished. Verse 36, Hezekiah and all the people rejoiced that, for that God had brought about his people and had done this so quickly. Chapter 30, Hezekiah now sends word to all the surrounding areas and lands and other tribes and nations. So here's what had happened. The kingdom had split. So Hezekiah has this vision. I'm going to draw us all back together for the first time ever since the days of Solomon. This is huge. I don't realize what a big undertaking this was. So he sent letters, wrote letters, and they're going to have a Passover, a celebration to the Lord. Verse 6, at the king's command, couriers went out throughout the land. And he goes on this, 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 ta- this passage of saying, People of Israel, return to the Lord, the God of Abraham. Verse 7, do not be like your parents and fellow Israelites who were unfaithful to the Lord. Verse 8, do not be stiff-necked as your ancestors were. Submit to the Lord. Come to his sanctuary, which he has consecrated forever. Serve the Lord your God so his fierce anger will turn away from you. Verse 26, there was great joy in Jerusalem since the days of Solomon, of David, the king of Israel. Nothing like this before in Jerusalem since then. Verse 27, the priests and the Levites stood to bless the people. God heard them, and their prayer reached heaven, his dwelling place. Chapter 31, when all of this had ended, the Israelites who were there went to the towns of Judah, and listen to what they did. They smashed the sacred stones, cut down the asher poles. They destroyed the high places and the altars throughout Judah and Benjamin and Ephraim and Manasseh. They destroyed all of them. They took all the evil tossed it out. Chapter 31. And a real quick summary because I'm only going to go back to those verses 20 and 21. So here's what Hezekiah did. He restored order. He restored order to the temple. He restored the priest's order and their responsibilities. He restored the Levites to worship. He restored the people to worship, tithing, and giving And he took everything that was wrong and did it according to Scripture and made it right. Verse 20 and 21, where we started. This is what Hezekiah did throughout Judah. Doing what was good and right and faithful before the Lord his God. In everything, say that with me. That he undertook in the service of God's temple and in obedience to the law and commands, he sought his God And worked wholeheartedly. And so he prospered. And that's a lot of stuff. That's four chapters. Big chunks of information. A lot of history. Some key thoughts this morning. Number one. Saying well this is Father's Day. What's Hezekiah got to do with Father's Day? He was a leader. 
He was a leader. Men, that's our primary role in our relationship to our families, to our wives, to our children, to everything that we have and everything that we are. We are leaders. God's called us to be overseers. God's called us to shepherd our families and shepherd those around us. So let's see what we can pull out of this story. Hopefully this is going to be something that will make sense to you. Again, I know it's a lot of information, but you had to get the context here. So first thing, this is the most important thing to realize in this example of Hezekiah's life. There is a right way and a wrong way to do things. Say amen. Amen. There is a right way and a wrong way to do things. Well, some of you sitting out there with your little sarcastic little smirk in your face, you're saying, well, duh. There's a right way and a wrong way to do everything. But how many times, how many times, men especially, because we have S's on our chests, we think we're supermen. We think we are invincible. How many times have we leaned into our own understanding and then it kind of didn't work out right and we just thought, well, that's just the way it goes. Let me just have you consider something. Have you ever thought that when we lean into our own understanding and it doesn't go right, that possibly the anger of the Lord came against that and stopped it? Because he wanted you to keep from making more foolish, stupid mistakes. Trying to get our attention. That's not the way I wanted you to do that. That's not a good plan. There's a plan that seems right in demand, but ultimately leads on to death. Doing things God's way is always the best in the right way. Well, that, yeah, we know that. But Ahaz did things his way. You saw that. He had the pattern before him. He knew what it was like to be a good king versus a not so good king. And you can see throughout the history in First and Second Kings and First and Second Chronicles the history that's repeated over and over again. And they did not do as the Lord their God guided them. Or they did do as the Lord God guided them as unto the days of David. There's a right way and there's a wrong way. Ahaz got God's wrath because he refused to listen to the instruction. Hezekiah prospered. Kind of like, which one do you want? Do you want to prosper? Or do you want the anger of the Lord coming towards your ideas and your plans? I mean, honestly, guys, men, men of the church, especially in our homes and our families, we need to make sure we have God's plan. There really is a right way to do marriage and a wrong way to do marriage. There really is a right way to do marriage and a wrong way to do marriage. Some of you know by experience you're doing it wrong right now. There's a right way and a wrong way to do families and raise children. Second thing. He got rid of everything that would defile the temple. He got rid of everything that would defile the temple. Let me say that one more time. He got rid of everything that would defile the temple. Now, we know that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Yes? God no longer dwells in buildings made by hands. Now he dwells in this place this morning, but it's because his people who are housing the temple and presence of the Lord are gathering together in his name and he shows up to honor that. But we can build the fanciest, most beautiful, most expensive building and he doesn't live here. He lives in you. He goes where you go. He goes where I go. And Hezekiah got rid of anything and everything that would potentially defile the sanctuary of the Lord and the Lord's temple. Now, there were some things that were obvious, but I do believe that Hezekiah would go, nah, get that, no, get rid of that as well. No, that's got to go. 
that's got to go. And since we are the temple of the Holy Spirit, I got to thinking about this. It's so amazing how much we bring into this temple. Some of you are like, oh, what, what? I mean, there's, there's a whole message on food and drink and all that kind of stuff that I could go into that really defiles the temple. Because we're being foolish and we're being childish with our, our choices and we're just stuffing this thing full of burritos. And he's like, I'm choking down here. No, I'm not saying burritos are bad. I like burritos. I like chips and salsa, especially lime chips. Nothing better than lime chips and queso. Got to have queso. But there's this ongoing consumerism among us in our culture. There's this ongoing consumption mentality. And the stuff that we bring into this temple. And all of us sitting here probably at some point has said, what difference does it make? Can I tell you, it makes a difference. Because we can go through statistics. We can look at history. We can look at medical records and know that there's a lot of things that you shouldn't take into the temple because it affects how your temple runs. Now, I'm, I'm a classic of that. They wanted to put me on this special diet after the heart surgery and I said to myself, and I said to them, look, I got here 60 years. I got another 60 to continue. Don't tell me what I can eat. Don't tell me what I can drink. But at some level, I did modify a whole lot because it's just foolish to sit there and go, let's just keep pouring it on. It doesn't make any difference. You know, I got a second chance on the table, so maybe I should pay attention to that, right? Too much salt will get you. Too much cholesterol and all the carbs that we eat will eventually get you, right? So again, that's a whole other message in and of itself, Pastor. Why'd you go there? Well, just because I felt like it. But anyway, even things that we watch and listen to. Listen, the word defilement means violation. How many times do we violate and offend the Spirit of the Lord by our negligence because we just think it doesn't make a difference? My point here is that you might just stop and ask the Holy Spirit, does this make a difference? And he might just tell you an answer that you didn't want to hear. And we keep doing things our way, as Ahaz, and the wrath of God, the judgment of God comes. And then we go, why? Why? Now, I'm, I'm not saying he's doing that to de defeat us. I'm saying he's doing that to correct us. He's got mercy. He's got grace. Ahaz had many opportunities to turn. He didn't do it. Now, I understand. I fully get it that this sounds really old school. Like, right? Yeah, I know. I'm old-fashioned. I have one foot in the grave because I'm 65. There's been a slow erosion of morals and ethics in our country over the last 50 to 75 years, and it has absolutely escalated at speed of light pace in the last two years. And I'm not saying that we veto everything and boycott everything in our culture, but we really need to take a closer look at what's defiling the temple. We really do. That may be where I go next. What does the Bible say about defilement of the temple? Third point. You with me? You listening? Hezekiah restored worship. The history of the church has gone all over the map with worship. I went to Baylor University. I was in the School of Music for a good while, and I studied all the genres of music through the years and the impact and church history and all that. Pretty amazing how actually stupid a lot of church people are through the years of how they viewed what was right, what was wrong. And I'm not here to debate all that. I'm just here to tell you that worship is an amazing tool in the hands of a believer and a leader. That's why... The kings always put the Levites in front to go into battle who were the worship leaders. They went into battle prepping for victory because 
I may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm really surrounded by you. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I rise above. This is how I gain victory in my life is through the worship that the Lord puts into my heart. God begins to fight those battles. You see, we worship what we give value to, what we give time to, what we give resources to. If God is as important as we say he is, then we must give him the worship that is due him. For, uh, fourth, Hezekiah did what was good and right and faithful to his God. In everything he did, he sought God and worked wholeheartedly. Say everything. 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 You know, as we started this morning, one of those subject titles was What Makes a Hero. And we are obsessed with hero worship in our culture, professional sports, Hollywood. Has just taken it off the charts over the years. And we worship people who have zero integrity and no values. We set them up, we idolize them, and they stand for nothing good, right. We buy their music and we buy their movies. And again, I know how. I know where some... I'm old school. I don't care what you call me. We really do need to closely evaluate what we bring into the temple. Hezekiah was a true hero in the sense that he took big risks. For God. He stood in the face of the enemy and he was going to do it alone if he had to. Made sacrifices to benefit those around him. And he was 25 years old. He had nothing to lose and everything to gain. So, men, fathers, dads, In everything he did, he sought God and worked wholeheartedly. Everything. Say everything. Everything. We are prone, men, to give everything we have to our work, our careers, our futures, and give God the leftovers. In everything, he sought his God wholeheartedly. And because of that, he prospered. Becca, would you mind bringing that board over here? Thank you. Father. What is a father? What does it mean to be a father? What's it mean to be a dad? What's it mean to be a man, a leader, a godly leader, a father figure? Well, based off of that passage, I wrote some things down and hope you can read all this. I asked Angela this morning, not you, Angela, but the other Angela, if she had good handwriting. And she said, "Eh, needed somebody to have some pretty fancy handwriting up here, but this is okay. Fearless. Hezekiah was fearless. He was faithful. He was available. Affection in the sense that he showed love and compassion and passion for his people. Trustworthy. I put table out there because he was a servant. He served his people well. He was handy. He was a helper. He was an encourager. He was an example. He was rich. Not in the sense of material things because, man, we got to get away from that one. You have all the stuff in the world.
are just existing and we're just trying to do the job and we're just trying to keep the money coming in to take care of things. But ultimately, in the role of a husband or a father or even a leader in our church or a leader in a church, I, I get this one. Apathetic. Through the years, we just grow apathetic and we just kind of keep doing and doing, grinding it out. Because you know, men, we can do that really well. We know how to grind it out, right? Tired. <laughs> time. <laughs> Doesn't seem like there's ever enough time, right? Got all these responsibilities. You've got people pulling at you and things pulling at you. You just don't seem to ever have enough time for your kids or for your family or for your church or for anything. I want to make sure I put the right words down here. Helpless. As a result of all this, you feel very helpless. Seems like regardless of the amount of effort you put in, ultimately, you feel rejected. I don't know where you are, but I think I wrote some of those things out because that's me. That's how I felt a lot of times. I know what's right to do. I know there's a right way and a wrong way, but... But here's the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Men, you know, a lot of times for Mother's and Father's Day, we give you little token gifts. Well, the guys decided, Ron and Angela decided that they didn't feel like there was anything that was just significant to give the ladies. And last year, we donated all the things that we would have done for you to other agencies and stuff. And so since we didn't do anything with the women this year, men, we're not doing anything for you. It would be very unfair, and there would be a lot of jealousy in your house. But the thought came to me. God's grace is an eraser. And I may not be perfect in all of this. I know I'm not. But I just know that according to scripture, if I do everything according to his design and his plan, and am I perfect in it? Are you perfect in it? Absolutely not. But in my desire to please him and honor him and move forward in my life and relationship with him, these things become the result. I become a good man. I become a, a godly man. I become a father figure. Now, the story I was telling you about when I opened up this morning about those three boys, the one boy said to me recently, he said, Pastor Randy, and it's amazing to me because he was only about five or six years old when he was in this church years ago, and, and, and Pastor Randy, don't ever, don't ever question your impact. Because of you, I'm where I am today. imperfectly following Jesus. A lot of mistakes. A lot of failures. Sometimes even apathy in there. But by the goodness of Jesus and his blood, he just cleans all that up. You know, several years ago, I gave you guys golf balls. Remember that, Joe? Because in golf, you play it the way I play it. You get mulligans. You get a do-over. Ah, that hook to the right. We're going to hit a mulligan. Oh, that went to the left. We're going to do another mulligan. I think you're only supposed to have, what, one mulligan per round? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Whew. So, closing out. Malachi 4, 6. 
This is a promise. It's a promise, but it requires obedience. And it requires doing things as God would do them. Malachi 4, 6, he will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers. The story of the three boys. As he kept turning the hearts of the boys back. Really, the boys turned before the father did, and then God created a unique situation in the father's life that got his attention, and the father turned back to the boys. He'll do that. Sometimes he'll bring us to near-death experiences to do that, right? So I'd like to close out with a prayer, a blessing. We're going to come back and do one more song because it just... I love this song. It's one of my favorites. It's build my life. I'm build my life on the foundation of your love. I will build my life on your love. That's my only hope. If I'm going to do this men thing, this father thing, this, this dad thing, this husband thing, this church leader thing, I got to do it on the foundation of your love. Now, speaking of church leadership, We've gone through a lot of changes over the years, and I just, I just want to tell you, some of you men already know who you are. I've, been, I've talked to you over the last several months. We've talked about different things. There's some men in this room that are in their 30s and 40s and low 50s that basically need to rise up and lead. The torch is being passed, whether you like it or not. The torch is hot. <laughs> Ain't going to burn you if you don't handle it right. <laughs> but you can you can, because you can do just like Hezekiah. You can do it the right way. You can restore worship in your home, and you can restore worship in the church, and everything that you do, you can do it if you'll pull out the defilement and do it God's way. He's good like that. He's faithful like that. Because he took a messed up 40-year-old and continued to have faith and believe that one day he would serve him the way he designed it. Father, we just thank you and praise you for your goodness, for your faithfulness. I thank you for the men in this church. I thank you for the dads in this church, the husbands in this church. I thank you for their love for you. I thank you that they have a heart for you. And that many of them are wrestling with just totally surrendering that heart so that you can do what you want. I know sometimes it feels scary and it feels, I don't know if I can do this. But where you guide us to go, you will provide us through it. Where you lead us, you will take us. You are so good. You're so good. Let's stand together. I want us to go ahead and close out Facebook. Thanks you. Thank you, folks, for being with us. Because when we finish with this song, I want to just tag one more word, give you a word of encouragement before we leave. Let's just do bridge, bridge and chorus.